Today our Colossians lesson is taking a turn. In the last few lessons we have been in a very um, exa Christ exalting um, series of passages that were so um, theological and doctrinal and and really um, the <clears throat> the the foundation of our faith in Jesus Christ and who he is. And so today Paul is is making a dramatic turn in that the emphasis is on his ministry. So it's gone from the heavenlies and and the uh, rule and reign of Jesus Christ down to the nuts and bolts of of Paul's uh, ministry. And so I I thought about what are some great job dis jobs that that people have had in the past. Um, you know, you you think of, I, I think of going back to my first job as a teenager. I worked in a drugstore, and it was the only drugstore in town, and so everybody came. And as a as such a little social butterfly, that suited me just fine, because I went to work and saw all my friends, and my friends' parents, and, and that sort of thing. And so my introduction into um, jobs away from the farm, it was just delightful. And, um, and then I would have to say um, my job as a mother was also a very rewarding and gratifying job to, to take these four children who are now adults and, and watch them grow and develop. Um, but um, my job description now is definitely um, ministry oriented, um, but I want my 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 goal is is that all of us would understand that whether you're on staff with an organization that is an evangelistic um, type ministry or not, whether you're still mothering or grandmothering or um, as a friend in your neighborhood or at work, regardless of what you do, you still have a job. You still have a ministry that you can learn something about Paul's description of his job and apply it into your situation. Because as believers, we all have a job. We all have a place in this ministry. So where we are today is Colossians 1, 24 to 29. And I'm going to just dip into chapter 2 just briefly, just because there are things in these passages that refer to, uh, to Paul's job, to his ministry. And so we're going to be looking for those things in this passage that describe Paul's job. Beginning at verse 24 of Colossians 1. Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is, the church, of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God that was given to me for you, to make the word of God fully known the mystery hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed to his saints. To them God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom, that we may present everyone mature in Christ. For this I toil, struggling with all his energy, that he powerfully works within me. For I want you to know how great a struggle I have for you and for those at Laodicea and for all who have not seen me face to face, that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love, to reach all the riches of full assurance of understanding and the knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I say this in order that no one may delude you with plausible arguments. For though I am absent in body, yet I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and the firmness of your faith in Christ. Now, the, the, the different things that are stated here that describe his job or his ministry, 
um, are several, that he is a minister of the church, a minister of the body of Christ, um, that he is proclaiming Jesus to them, that he's warning and teaching, um, that he is his goal is to present everyone mature. He says, I toil, I struggle in all of this. He says that um, he is going to be, in, in later chapters, he's going to be using this job, this ministry. One of his goals is to refute uh, false teachings. We see, see that in chapter 2, verse 4. I say this in order that no one may delude you with arguments. And so throughout this passage that I just read, it it is clearly Paul Paul's understanding that his ministry is for the church, for the body of Christ, and he gets specific about what that looks like. And so my goal is for all of us to understand that we can take some um, some of those descriptions and apply them in our own life as we take on our own ministry that God's given to each one of us. Hope you do. I just really hope that you do understand that if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, if you are a born again Christian, you have a job to do. You are not here just kind of um, doing some meaningless, rote, routine work. Your work, your whatever your God's given you to do, working in a store, working um, um, from home, n- no matter what it is, it has implications for eternity, for uh, whatever the... Uh, the verse that jumps to my mind, whatever your hands find to do, do it heartily as unto the Lord. So if you're cleaning houses and toilets, clean houses and toilets as beautifully and wonderfully as you can in the name of the Lord. All right. So the first thing we see in this passage that Paul mentions as part of his job, interestingly enough, is suffering suffering for for the sake of others in the body of Christ. Isn't that interesting that he would say that suffering was for the sake of other believers? He says, I am filling in my flesh up, filling up in my flesh what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of the body, that is the church, that is us. Now, um, it isn't in any way, Paul is not saying that there's lacking, there's a lack or an insufficiency in the sufferings of Jesus Christ. Uh, his sufferings were complete and sufficient to buy, purchase our salvation. So that's clearly stated in so many places in Scripture. We know that's not what he means. What he's talking about is that our suffering or his suffering and, and, and consequently our suffering is to draw attention to the, um, the positive influence that our suffering can have in sharing the gospel with other people. I want to... Um, read to you a story that uh, I found this week that was told of an indigenous missionary. This this man walked barefoot from village to village preaching the gospel in India. His hardships were many, and after a long day of many miles and much discouragement, he came to a certain village and tried to speak the gospel, but was driven out of town and rejected. So he went to the edge of the village, dejected, and lay down under a tree and slept from exhaustion. When he awoke, people were hovering over him, and the whole town was gathered around to hear him speak. The headman of the village explained to him that they came to look him over while he was sleeping. When they saw his blistered and bloody feet, they concluded that he must be a holy man and that they had been evil to reject him. They were sorry 
and wanted to hear his message that he was willing to suffer so much to bring to them. So I love that story because it's a, it's a beautiful picture of how our suffering gets the attention of those who are not believers, especially if we, um, if we don't complain about it, if we don't whine and, and blame God for it, if we just accept it at, with grace um, and with joy even, because Paul says, now I rejoice in my sufferings. Uh, so there is a, a response to suffering that is attractive to the non-Christian, and it draws their it draws them in and want causes them to want to know more about what who are you, what is it about you that gives you this kind of perspective on your cancer or whatever. Um, I love the story of. Um, Oh, I can't remember her last name, but her first name's Amy, who is a local gal here in the Flathead Valley who had um, just a horrific, horrific cancer situation. Um, This was last year, maybe over a two-year period. And she's, she's traveled to many different doctors, Mayo Clinic and different places, to, to find help. And doctors are always saying, now tell me your story. Tell me your cancer story. And she would always say, no, I don't want to talk about my cancer. I want to talk about my Jesus. Consequently, over the two-year period, close to 20 people from the medical profession, doctors and nurses and um, you know, clinicians of all stripes have come to Christ because of the influence of this woman who is suffering with joy, suffering with a purpose, suffering in such a way that she can draw attention to Jesus Christ. And so that, I think, is what Paul is saying here about um, his sufferings, that they are for our sake, for the sake of the church, and that the only lack is that there is still suffering to be done among believers. Um, So, you know, take that as as you want to. (laughs) It's good news, bad news, but there is still suffering to be done. That That is the only insufficiency or lack that Paul is talking about, that the suffering isn't over, but that um, all of us will walk through something difficult that will be for the sake of um, evangelism or maybe for the sake of the body, the church, that we will uh, be good stewards of what God has given to us in this area of suffering. Now, let's talk about Paul's suffering for just a minute. We find in 2 Corinthians chapter 6 that this man suffered in, in more ways than you and I will ever, ever understand. Um, It tells us in verse 4 that um, by great endurance, he suffered in all kinds of afflictions, hardships, calamities, beatings, imprisonments, riots, labors, sleepless nights, and hunger. We see in that, uh, that passage, hold on, I've got my pages out of order, that he also, in in verse 8, Uh, He suffered through dishonor, through slander. He was treated as an imposter. He was um, treated as one who was unknown, as dying, as punished, as sorrowful, as poor, as having nothing. Then in chapter 11 of 2 Corinthians, we see that... um, He had far greater labors, far more imprisonments than anyone else. He had countless beatings, often near death. Five times he received at the hands of the Jews 40 lashes, less one, so 39. Um, Three times he was beaten with rods. Once he was stoned. Three times he was shipwrecked. Um, a a, A day and a night he was adrift at sea. 
on frequent journeys, in danger from rivers, danger from robbers, danger from his own people, danger from the Gentiles, danger in the city, danger, 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 Roger, danger. It's just everything. He was in toil and hardship, sleepless nights, hunger, thirst, often without food and cold and exposure. Um, and so the the suffering that he endured for the sake of the body, it was just, it was remarkable that he survived it. And ultimately, we know that he didn't, that he died a martyr's death. Um, we also hear, not just from Paul, but from Peter, in 1 Peter four twelve through 19, where, where Peter said, Do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange was happening to you. He says, no, rejoice in so far as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. And I love this passage. We looked at it last year when we did the, the study of First Peter, First and Second Peter, um, that he starts off by saying, why are you surprised that you're suffering? As you know, Christians, why would you be surprised? And I think a lot of the surprise comes to us, and and you know, nothing's changed because this was written two thousand years ago by Peter, and he's he knows that people are surprised. Christians are often surprised when a fiery trial comes to them because it's there to test us, and um, we shouldn't be surprised because that's clearly stated in many places in scripture. Jesus himself said in Mark eight thirty five, for whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. He said, take up your cross and follow me. He said, die to yourself and follow me. And so um, it's not like we should be surprised when suffering comes our way. But I think part of the problem for us today is that we live in America. And somehow we have come to the conclusion that as American Christians, we're sheltered from any kind of um, trials and tribulation. And that, you know, we will be, we will be raptured when the tribulation comes and so, therefore, we will not have to uh, endure that tribulation. So, if we're not going to endure that tribulation, why am I? Why would I think that I need to endure any other kind of tribulation? And that's just not true. Um, that is that is uh, some false teaching that has gone out into the world, probably through kind of the prosperity gospel, the name it and claim it gospel. That uh, you know, if your faith is strong enough, you won't you won't have to go through this stuff. And uh, unfortunately, that's that's false teaching that a lot of people have bought into. I uh, appreciate a statement that was made by a Christian in China, where persecution is commonplace. And this Christian stated, uh, this Chinese Christian stated, I feel that we are handling our persecution in China far better than you American Christians are handling your prosperity. And that's a very strong indictment to, against American Christians because it's saying that the slightest little thing that comes up in America in our prosperity, and we're crying foul. We're going to God and saying, that's not fair. You weren't supposed to do this to me. I've been a good Christian. And um, that that's just so unbiblical. Suffering is part of our, our job description as Christians. It is going to be there. And so um, the, the response to it is supposed to be joy. Rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings. 
He suffered for us, and so we also suffer in his name. So let's look at some specifics of uh, Paul's job description. In Acts 9, you know the story of uh, Saul coming to Christ on the, the road to Damascus after being a persecutor of Christians uh, and, and meeting Jesus on that road in such a dramatic fashion. And he was blinded by the light of Christ. He uh, was led by the, by the hand, by his helpers, into Damascus and was taken to Ananias. And um, the Lord, I'm going to read to you Ananias, um, what the Lord said to Ananias in preparation for meeting Saul, this very dangerous uh, uh, Christian terrorist. He, or Jewish terrorist, I guess you would say. He was, a, he was very um, um, protective of the Jewish tradition, and he was going around killing Christians. So <clears throat> the Lord said to Ananias, Go, this man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name." Now, in that, in that passage, we see that, that God himself is saying that, that Saul, whose name was going to be changed to Paul, um, that his job description is that he will proclaim the name of the Lord, Jesus Christ, to the Gentiles, to kings, and to the people of Israel, and... To suffer, so that's clearly stated that suffering would be part of his job description. In addition, that he would be he would be sharing the gospel, proclaiming the name of Jesus to Gentiles, to kings, and to the people of Israel. And if you've read the book of Acts, you know that he did in fact uh, fulfill his responsibilities in all of those areas. Now. Specifically, he's mentioning in Colossians, as well as here in, um, in Acts, that his, his um, target audience was the Gentiles, uh, Jews and Gentiles and kings. But for, this, for the, um, the purpose of this passage we're studying in Colossians, you can see that he is mentioning in our passage today, that he was given the responsibility to make God fully known, Jesus Christ fully known, um, to these, the generations of, of Gentiles. The Colossians themselves were Gentiles. And so he says um, to them, to the Gentiles, God chose to make known how great are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Now, you understand that um, in ages past, from, from this day and time that Paul is referring to, the Old Testament prophets knew that there was going to be something really revolutionary that was going to be happening in the future. And they, they spoke of that in their prophecies, but they didn't truly understand it. And here Paul is calling it a mystery. Now, we're not speaking of a mystery in the sense of a mystery novel that needs to be solved. You know, some like a murder mystery that needs to be solved or some other kind of mystery. No, what he's referring to is that the, the the Holy Spirit inspired the prophets to write about something that was going to happen in the future, but they didn't understand it. They wrote it, but they didn't understand it. It was just foreign, a foreign concept to a Jewish prophet to think that, okay, God, at some point, you're going to send your son to die. Okay, we don't even we don't even understand that you have a son that is going to take on human flesh and that he's going to die. We don't understand that, but we're going to write it down anyway because you inspired us to. But we also, even more baffling to us, is that you're going to offer forgiveness of sins. You're going to offer 
to dwell by your Holy Spirit in Gentiles? That just boggles the mind. Why would you do that? We are your chosen people. Why, why, why bother going outside of, of the nation of Israel? And so Paul uh, understands that. He writes in the book of Ephesians, and let me just read a little bit of this from chapter 3. He says, For this reason I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, on behalf of the Gentiles. Okay? He understands that his ministry is on behalf of the Gentiles. Um, He says, Assuming that you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you, how the mystery was, was made known to me by revelation, as I have written briefly. When you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. This mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Of this gospel, I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given me by the working of his power. To me, though I am the very least of the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to bring to light for for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for God, for ages in God who created all things. So, this mystery, this word mystery keeps popping up in all of Paul's writings and as well as what we've been already seen in Colossians. So we're going to see the mystery being the mystery of Jesus Christ coming to the earth and providing salvation. We see that the mystery is referring to the inclusion of the Gentiles uh, into the um, into the 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 fold into the the chosen people and we're also going to see the mystery that is jesus christ indwelling us which blows it still blows my mind today that jesus indwells us and the mystery also of jesus christ being um all wisdom all knowledge and our greatest treasure so we're going to look at the, the in, in the weeks to come, we're going to look at all of these ways that the mystery is being revealed. But Paul sees this as his, um, as his job description. Now, um, some other specifics about the job description that Paul is explaining to us in Colossians 1. And I want to look closely here at verses... Um, 28 and 29. In him we proclaim, or him we proclaim, warning everyone, teaching with all wisdom, presenting everyone mature. And this is hard work. Okay, so let's look at some of those things. The first one is him we proclaim. Christ and Christ alone is all we need to be sharing with other people. We get so tied up in a wad of sharing uh, maybe just about some of the benefits of being a Christian, um, that you will be more successful if you become a Christian. Um, You know, we we come up with all kinds of side trails to kind of make our message a little more soft and um, attractive instead of just saying, you know what, let me just tell you about my Jesus. That's all I want to tell you about is that Jesus is my Savior. Jesus took a sinner like me and totally transformed me. Now I'm saved by his grace. He shed his blood on the cross for me. And so we share Jesus. We don't share our church. We don't share, you know, um, 10 ways you'll be a better person if you become a Christian. We proclaim 
him and him alone. I like the job description that Jesus himself gives gave us in Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. So he starts with go and make disciples. Disciples, not disciples of the church, not disciples of your Bible study, not disciples of a new way to live, disciples of Jesus Christ. Okay, that's our first job. Make disciples of Jesus Christ. Um, making sure that they're baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. But then then the job description gets more specific, teaching them to observe all of the commands of Jesus Christ. This is so similar to what is stated in verse 28 of Colossians 1. He starts by saying, Him we proclaim. So we teach Jesus. We talk about Jesus um, and, and I want to say too, in, in both in, um, Jesus' statement in Matthew 28, as well as in implied in Colossians, uh, when we see Paul speaking to the Gentiles, our message of proclaiming Jesus Christ is to go to everyone. Okay. All nations, all races, all people groups, uh, we are to never assume that we have any kind of superiority or or anything that would exclude another people group. The gospel message is for all nations. So we proclaim Jesus. That's the our only proclamation is Jesus. But then verse twenty eight, Paul says warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom. So let's look at those two um, statements, warning and teaching. Um, The word warning, in some passages it may say admonish, and it may say counsel. Uh, But it's the idea of bringing God's word to bear on the mind and the conscience. It's a big part of discipling. When Jesus said, make disciples, They come to Christ, and then we disciple them. So um, we're helping others renew their thinking in line with God's Word. I know um, um, Romans 12, 1 and 2 talks about, verse 2 especially, talks about being um, being conformed to the image of Christ through the um, transformation and the renewing of our minds. So our minds have to be transformed. Our consciousness has to be transformed um, so that we begin to think in line with God's Word. Um, uh, Our word for that could be counseling. When someone's struggling with a problem and you sit down with them and share God's Word with them on that specific issue, so that they can see their problem from a biblical perspective and work towards change, then you are admonishing that person. So admonish, warn, counsel, all of that. We, there's not a one of us who can't do that. We all have the, um, the capability, if we know how to use our Bibles, we can sit down with someone who's going through a great struggle, whether it's a relational problem, a health problem, an emotional problem, um, whatever it might be, that they would be able, you and I would be able to sit down with them with the Bible and, um, and give them the kind of advice that they need because they, they need to know that the, their previous mindset or or view of life was based on something other than the Bible. And it's important that they get that, uh, get make that shift in their thinking. 
Uh, and then the other thing that he says, um, teaching with all wisdom. So that's the instructive side um, that happens. It not necessarily one on one. It can happen one on one, but this would be referring more to the um, the biblical teaching uh, from a sermon, from going to Bible study, from going to a sun- Sunday school class from just digging deep into our own uh, uh, Bibles on our own. Um, so to, to uh, teach with all wisdom. So we keep on digging into to God's Word, uh, bringing it out and trying to unpack it so we can see what it says and how it applies to our lives. So this is discipling, presenting Christ, everything that He taught, constantly admonishing, correcting, instructing, applying it to ourselves, and pouring it into other believers, with the end result being maturity. You know, we aren't here to just fill time slots and make people feel religious. We're here to disciple and prepare people to give a good account at the judgment seat of Christ. Peter said in his letter to crave pure spiritual milk, Scripture so that we would grow up to spiritual maturity. Paul, in another place, says, you know, you're, you're still drinking milk. Where, why aren't you eating meat by now? Grow up in your faith. And then finally, we see that this is not easy stuff. It's, it's not easy to do all of this. Paul clearly states in this this uh, Colossians 1 passage, that I toil, I struggle. It's not something that is a cushy job by any stretch of the imagination. He says, I toil, struggling with all his energy that he powerfully works within me. So, you know, yes, it's hard work. Yes, we toil but we toil with his energy. And, you know, it's even so interesting how Paul states in another passage, Philippians, I think it is, that that the toiling is done even in our weakness, our human insufficiencies, or in, you know, we're just not, we're not uh, strong in every area. And so he even uses our weaknesses to show himself, to, that Jesus shows himself strong in our weaknesses. But I also want to um, close with this, this word from Peter, 1 Peter 4, 10 and 11. As each of you has received a gift, now let me just stop right there. Each one of you who is listening to this YouTube audio Every single one of you, if you are a believer, you have a gift, a spiritual gift. So he says, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Whoever speaks as one who speaks oracles of God. Whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies. In order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To him belongs the glory of God and dominion forever and ever. Amen. So ladies, that's that's Paul's message to us today, is that we all have a job. We all have been given the grace of God through a gift, some spiritual gift. Are you using your spiritual gift? Are you taking advantage of every opportunity that comes your way to share Jesus with a non-Christian? Are you going on walks with Christian friends who are struggling? Are you having, sitting over a cup of coffee with a friend who's going through a a relational struggle or who's lost a baby or who's, um, you know, their, their problems at work or whatever it might be? Are you understanding that you have a job to do in the body of Christ. I hope you have understood that, and I hope you're doing it, because the Holy Spirit will fill you with all sorts of strength and energy and wisdom 
in order to accomplish that task. Thanks for listening, girls.